Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the 2022-2023 Tomorrow Talk series. My name is Kyle Jensen, and I'm the Director of Writing Programs at Arizona State University. Tomorrow Talks place thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our most pressing challenges as a society. This year, the series celebrates trailblazers, in addition to Jonathan Franzen, who we welcome this evening, we're hosting fiction writer Jocelyn Nicole Johnson next week on October 13th, Booker Prize finalist Percival Everett in November, and sports journalist Jamel Hill in January. Tomorrow Talks are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU and hosted by ASU's Department of English in partnership with Macmillan Publishers. Now allow me to introduce our speakers for this evening. Jonathan Franzen is the author of five novels, including The Corrections, Freedom, and Crossroads, and five works of nonfiction, most recently Farther Away and The End of the End of the Earth, all published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. He lives in Santa Cruz, California. The paper book ed paperback edition of Crossroads is now available per for purchase, so go out and get your copy today. Jonathan, uh, John will be in conversation with Matt, our colleague Matt Bell, who is the author most recently of the novel Appleseed, a New York Times notable book, and the craft book Refuse to be Done, How to Write and Rewrite a Novel in Three Drafts. He is also the author of the novels Scrapper and In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, as well as the short story collection A Tree or a Person or a Wall, a nonfiction book about the classic video game Baldur's Gate 2 and several other titles. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Esquire, Tin House, Orion, and many other publications. A native of Michigan, he teaches creative writing at Arizona State University. Please welcome me in joining, and please welcome, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Franzen and Matt Bell. Here we are. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for being here with us today. It's really a pleasure to get to talk to you about Crossroads, which I I loved, and uh, and I you know I don't think I'm wrong in saying it's my favorite novel of yours. It felt really personal and close to me, and I'm really glad to have the chance to read it and to get to talk to you about it. So thank you for it. Um, before we get into Crossroads itself, I wondered if we could start more broadly with sort of personal experience and the potential of literature to contact, connect readers and writers. Um, in your essay collection, How to Be Alone, which is another of my favorite books of yours, a book I think about a lot, you write about the novel Desperate Characters by Paula Fox, a book that you've had, a, I think, a long and powerful relationship with, a book that comes up a lot in conjunction with you. Um, in the, one of those essays, you wrote about a moment of recognition what was happening in the book and what was happening in your life at the time you discovered it came together you wrote that someone besides me had suffered from these ambiguities and had seen light on the other side that fox's book had been published and preserved that i could find company and consolation and hope in an object pulled almost at random from a bookshelf felt akin to an instance of religious grace um i really loved that sort of description of it i have my own examples of those kind of moments uh, i think there's a moment in dennis johnson's story work that feels like one of those to me, that feels like an origin story moment for me, right? I sort of felt that. Um, when you could talk maybe about moments like that in your life, and then also as a, as a writer, is it possible to design these moments of grace and recognition for readers? Are they lucky accidents? If they occur only accidentally, is there a way to write that makes the conditions for them more likely to occur? Well, first of all, thanks for the lovely uh, introduction, uh, both of you. And um, yes, two-part question. Yes, uh, always. <laughs> and we, right, and we may not need to get to another question. That is that is such a big pair of questions. Right. Um, uh, thank you also to uh, everyone who's come out on a Wednesday night or stayed home on a Wednesday night to stare at a screen. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I only wish I could be there in person, mm. which is really preferable uh, for reasons related to your question, I think. Uh, I, I, I started out um, as a pure, just entertainment reader. Um, I, I was into the classic fantasy novels, sci-fi in high school. And then I then I kind of got a certain kind of religion in college where I I discovered literature with a capital L, 
and um, and thought, hey, I'm going to write some literature myself. <laughs> I never really let go of that that reader in me who who just wants a good story. Um, I always wanted to connect with that reader, but I I, I also had ambitions um, and ambitions of changing the world. Um, even though there weren't very many examples of novels that had changed the world <laughs> in a measurable way, somehow uh, I overlooked that and thought that's what I'm going to do. Then just, yes, in, as described in that essay, um, there, there came a point where that wasn't working. Uh, the world was obstinately refusing to be changed. Mm. In fact, it seemed only to be getting worse. And what's more, people weren't seeming to read books anymore. And I was in a really, really dark place. And that's when I came upon that Paula Fox novel. Um, and that was that really was, for me, well, okay, well, at that point, you did ask a, a long and <laughs> no, no, you're great. You're doing so I'm, I'm just going to rattle on here. here. I, I would say going back to my first deep loves as a reader, I would go back to C.S. Lewis and the Narnia books, mm -hmm. uh, which I started reading in fourth or fifth grade. And and already then, at least in retrospect, I have to say that what was great about those books was that those kids weren't innocent. They mm. did bad things and they knew they were doing bad things. Yeah. And that was really true to my own experience. So I think already then the, those books got their hook in me because I recognized something about myself. I, and it wasn't about, you know, really nice kids having amazing adventures and, or being threatened by, you know, dark forces or whatever. No, the dark forces were in the kids themselves. And I got that because I had all sorts, I was sitting on all sorts of guilt and I'd, you know, I'd once tossed a little frog in a campfire. I mean, I had all these things that just tormented yeah, me. Yeah. They, I'd done bad things. Um, and and then, yes, when I hit Paula Fox, that particular novel, and then began to read other novels that were not highly regarded at the time as mm -hmm. great literature, um, and I'm talking about some early books of Jane Smiley, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. certainly Dennis Johnson. I, I came to around that time. Here were people who were not taking on the big issues of the day mm -hmm. in any meaningful way. And they were not trying to be great. You know, they were not trying to write another Ulysses. Right. They were writing about people. Mm. And the thing is, and this gets now to your second question, how do you, how do you, well, sorry. <laughs> One small step back. That came to be my new idea of what mm. books and literature are for. Serious, serious fiction is for. It is for people who may be a little isolated, mm. may be isolated by the very fact that they like to read books, mm. and that my job really is to participate in that community and make that human connection. So I, I, I went from trying to impress people or change them to just trying to make a connection. How do you do that? How do you orchestrate that? Well, you don't really. <laughs> um, you, you try to write close and honestly about a character you've made up or a set of characters you've made up and really, really try to imagine, put them in difficult situations try to imagine what they're thinking and feeling in these difficult situations and hope that sometimes something that comes out of that process of intensely imagining a real person in a real difficult situation um, will set off that same kind of light bulb of recognition in the reader. You can't, I, I think it's, and, and, and the thing is I, I, I tend to write novels with multiple main characters mm -hmm. and I'll hear from different people. Oh, I recognize this in this character or I recognize this, but often, but seldom do they recognize things from several characters. It's like they just recognize this one character. Anyway, that was a long answer. No, oh, that's a great answer. <laughs> it's funny thinking about that idea of like recognizing different, <clears throat> like who you identify with in a book like Crossroads or, or the corrections or something else. Um, I think one of the joys of of getting a little older, I'm I'm 42, is like I'm more likely to recognize myself in like two different characters in a family drama than I I would have when I was 30, right? Um, and I think it's often uh, I'm I'm continually shocked at my particular age to often start identifying with the younger characters and at some point realize like oh I'm the age of the older character, you know, like <laughs> you have that like right? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I misidentified myself in the story. 
Although, yeah, I think there's, I mean, there is a subtle difference between identification and recognition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are, there are masters of description, people who, who just pay attention to little things and manage to capture uh, in a sentence something that uh, you've, you've seen many times, you may have noticed many times, that you've never really brought it to consciousness. Here someone has noticed it and described it perfectly, and you immediately recognize, oh, yeah, I know that kind of that weird thing that happens kind of in the region of my butt when I stand too close to a cliff. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's – and that – and and that's and and it, hopefully the, the the more accurately the more closely you observe and and then do the work of trying to render what you have observed in good clean language hopefully that it's not just a single instance and it doesn't even have to do with necessarily whether you identify with the character or like the character it's just that 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 growing sense of oh i'm in a recognizable world right and isn't it weird? I'm in a recognizable world, but what I'm doing is I'm holding, you know, processed tree pulp uh, with ink marks on it. Right. Like, and yet I feel like I'm in a world I recognize. That's the crazy thing about reading. Yeah. You know, you, you were talking about the the Narnia books, which which were, I think, a similar kind of portal for me, you know, and and that way um, I grew up in a big Midwestern family. I'm the oldest of five, you know, and, and from Michigan. And I, I think a lot about the ways that books as a, as a kid and as, even as an adult were ways to like be alone in a room full of people or to be in a different place in a world full of people that they were, uh, certainly there's all these reasons to read, but one of the first reasons for me to read was just to like go into a place where I could be by myself on an adventure while being surrounded by my enormous family. Definitely. It was a place of safety for me, too, because yeah, um, yeah. I, I was I was a kid in the, you know, I was starting to read in the late 60s, early 70s. There was a lot of conflict in my household between my kind of 19th century parents and my rebellious children of the 60s brothers. Um, and, you know, just just I'm going to go upstairs. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I want to mention another book that meant a lot to me, and I think this is true for a whole lot of writers of my generation. That's Harriet the Spy, Louis yeah, Fitzhugh's um, novel. It is a it is technically a YA novel, I guess, uh, a children's book, as Paula Fox herself, a children's book author, insisted on calling them. She rejected YA. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't care if, the, if you're 14, you're not a young adult, you're a child. I write children's <laughs> Anyway, um, there again, you have this person who is who is a bit of an outsider, Harriet, and she's observing and she's writing down in her notebook. Uh, and at a certain point, her that just explodes into her entire school class rejecting her. They won't mm-hmm. speak to her for months. Yeah. Uh, and because she's written things about people in her class, she's written honest and true things. And, um, yeah, boy, did I recognize that the way that internal posture of isolation can blossom into wild social unpopularity. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting how many, like, uh, let's say children's books, I think I'm happier with that term too, um, are about like that standing outside and observing, which is also training for being a writer, which is also this way of sort of, um, at least imagining yourself apart the way that we imagine ourselves apart in order to get to this place of recognition or get to this place of community, which is sort of an interesting space to end up in. I agree. <laughs> Great. Let me, uh, let's move to, let's talk about Crossroads a little bit. Uh, All right. I, I, I think a lot of people in the audience have been reading the book and get ready, but just for people who, who haven't, I just wanted to say briefly to put people on the, I guess, the screen for us today. Um, a lot of your novels are focused on uh, families, Midwestern families, their sort of interior lives, their troubles, their secrets. Um, novels are often moving back and forth across long chunks of time. In Crossroads, the families, the Hildebrands, Russ and Marion, their children, Clem, Becky, Perry, and Judson, and the action largely confined to a single day before Christmas, 1971, and then a short stretch of time around the following Easter. Um, 
In an interview at Vulture, you said that you arrived at this book through something you'd been pondering for a long time, a wish to write about the fundamentally irrational basis for everything we think and do and espouse. Uh, characters at Crossroads are all part of a pastor's family. Much of the plot takes place within the youth group that Russ once led, and every character in the novel has their own relationship with God and religion, even if they don't believe in God. Um, and I think more importantly, like the sort of intersection between their personal moralities and what moralities they see as posed from outside and how can they can make their like own wants fit those moralities. Um, I wonder if you could talk about how you thought about the, finding the sort of various moralities of the Hildebrands, how you um, decide what kind of moral decisions create sort of powerful fiction. It's not as easy as like, should Russ commit adultery or should Perry lie about selling drugs? Should Clem join the draft? Like the yes and no is not a story. No, but those are problems. Yeah. <laughs> those are problems. So yeah, just briefly, uh, the father is, um, he's suffered a career humiliation and a personal humiliation. He's, uh, as people who've suffered something like that might do on occasion, um, he's 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 trying to get his edge back, and he's mm -hmm. focused on getting somewhere with a young widow in his congregation. Uh, even though that's the last thing a pastor should be doing is putting himself in the way of an affair with a parishioner. That's a pretty big no-no, uh, and. No less in 1971 than today. <laughs> um, uh, and yes, Perry Perry has gotten himself in. Uh, he, he he has a kind of inordinate need for intoxicants, and mm -hmm. to fund that, uh, he has seen no recourse but to actually start selling drugs to seventh graders. Um, and Clem's situation is he's on a student deferment, which many um, suburban kids, uh, notably white kids in the late 60s, uh, had that they avoided the Vietnam War simply by virtue of their parents being able to send them to college. He's decided, no, that's not right. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't actually set out to frame moral problems. Um, if I have any message tonight, uh, it's that everything grows out of setting up a good story. Mm. Um, if you've set up a good story, it's going to put the characters in a position where they have to make decisions. Well, what do you think about when you're trying to make a decision? You think about what's right and what's wrong. So rather than coming in advance with some notion of I'm going to problematize the morality of such and such. It's I, I'm going to try to find a uh, an, a funny um, but also um, significant and hopefully reasonably fresh story to tell about each of the characters, and and that entails trying to figure out within the framework of the novel, what they want. Mm -hmm. Well, they, we all want lots of things. Um, uh, in about half an hour, I'm going to really want dinner. Um, <laughs> not, not a very useful principle for the novelist. Um, in, you know, unless you have a character who hasn't eaten in 37 days, is on a hunger, hunger strike, um, and is now being tempted by somebody in the, in the next cell who has a burrito. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that that person really wants dinner actually signifies something, but by and large, it doesn't. So, but that points toward really what the essence of it is. Uh, you, 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 need, you need to create a situation in which someone really, really, really needs something. Mm. And also simultaneously that this is something that is not easily attained. And that's useful because it makes a good story. Okay. But I think it's also, to get back to what we started talking about, that sense of identification, that sense, mm -hmm. well, here's where identification becomes important. Um, because I have in my old age, uh, recognized 
a strange thing, which is that I don't have to like a character to want to read about the character if he, she, they is desperately pursuing something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I would also stress just as a technical matter, it doesn't have to be very big. Right. It just has, to, and in fact, the smaller it is, the greater the, the, the voltage between how enormously the character wants it and how, and how small it is, that is typically associated with comedy. Right. Um, so that's, that's my short lecture on, on fiction. But, but here's the thing, it's like, you don't have to sit there staring at a blank page if you've given a lot of thought to, well, what, what is it the character wants and what's in the way? The pages sort of write themselves. It's like, well, I'm, I'm going to write about the character going out and trying to get it. Oh, something happens. No, you can't have it. Right. Or, <laughs> or, or even just stopping in a street and the character's conscience says, no, you shouldn't want that. Whatever it is, you know, and, and, and one thing, we, well, what happens then? We, I mean, we, 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 we've identified that with this character who wants something and that, you know, it's, this is really, really basic stuff. It's the kind of thing, I mean, you probably should be teaching it in the first class in fiction right. writing at the, at, yeah. the, at the elementary level. And yet it's remarkable how many books arrive in the mail. People send me books where I'm still like on page 30 or 40 trying to figure, well, who, what do they want? What's, what, what's the story here? Like, what are they after? Um, it seems like we're getting scenes and we're getting locales and it's beautiful writing, very lyrical, blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, remember me, the reader, the reader wants a story. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I went back to the beginning of Crossroads after finishing it, like the, the first sentence or two is like about Russ and Marion, right? Like, it's like that want is like immediate. On the Russ page. and Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, immediately there that we sort of have that. It was uh, I was thinking about maybe with Russ and uh, uh, especially like you were talking about his humiliation creating sort of like kind of like impetus for his affair and the way uh, where you you want the character to want something but and then like the thing they want they're humiliated and the thing they want is this like huge risk of like future humiliation right like obviously like this would destroy his life in another way and how compelling it is sometimes to like watch a person make a decision that makes sense for their life for like all the wrong reasons or the right maybe the reasons right there like because i was humiliated i need this thing to make me feel good but it's like you can see like the the sort of aftershock of that long before we get to it it's a long time before that storyline you know sort of finishes um yeah it, and I feel like all the have some version of that right um so just in this hypothetical instance, you know, not only once you've once you've sort of set things in motion and you have a character pursuing something and then it's like, well, maybe now that now that I've interested a reader in reading and turning the pages. Right. Maybe you'd like to know why this thing is so important to that character. Yeah. So we'll we'll go back in time a little bit and we'll maybe not give you the whole story immediately, but we'll give you some ideas about what not only what the thing is, but what it represents to that character. Um, hopefully not in too broad a way, but suggest, give, give, give a reader some clues about why, why this is so important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In the case of Russ, he was, uh, the humiliation is that he was the leader of the church youth group right. and the church youth group kicked him out. Yeah. The kids kicked him out. They said, we're all quitting if this guy doesn't go. Um, and a humiliation for an adult, yeah. especially in an era like the early 70s, um, when there was when the, the cool kids were cool in a, in a way that cool kids had never been before. They were really seriously different um, mm. and they really, really, you know, don't trust anyone over 30. Um, they really had contempt for adults uh, and their old ways of doing things um yeah anyway so yeah <laughs> no i think that's a, a a nice place to segue i think one of the the things i really recognize in russ is that difference between like when you're you're you know he's been the youth pastor for 10 years the assistant pastor for 10 years and there's a place where 
people feel like they respect you and sort of get you and, and then there's some kind of change or the kids change or whatever it is and like now you feel like you're in a different place and that can be I see that be hard for other people to deal with it's, it will be and is for me as well I think uh to go back to my very serious long-winded questions um I think a lot of the plot in Crossroads revolves around like the generational differences between the the Hildebrandt parents and their kids, but also in the backstory between Russ's Mennonite parents and his de his desires for his life, um, and what he sees as like failures and their their belief system. Uh, Marion's navigation of her beliefs and the choices that she makes or is forced into as a young woman, including a, an abortion that's acquired under. Uh, uh, tragic, almost like horror novel circumstances. Like it's really, I think, an interesting part of the book. Um, there's not like a pendulum effect in the movie, like where people are moving from progressive to conservative back and forth. But there is like these plot points, like Clem's decision to forego his college deferment and go to the draft that at least contains an element of like attack on his father's beliefs, right? Or he knows that what's going to do to his father. He worries it's going to hurt his father, but he also like, it's part of his like becoming a person um yes i i I'm, I'm really worried that it's going to hurt my father for me to crush him with right. my mental superiority <laughs> yeah it's like oh the poor man <laughs> yeah and i god and I, damn I, him must be crushed <laughs> he says he's so moral i'll show you moral yeah yeah uh that feels like we're talking with a lot of college students in the audience it feels like a particularly college student-y sort of thing you know i think i'm as a college student yeah 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 right and i yeah, think a lot of and, my own like first semester home Thanksgiving, you know, where you now know everything about the world because you've had 10 weeks of college. Um, it's an interesting place to sort of inhabit. Uh, and I just wondered if you could talk about maybe like, some of it, I'm sure just because it's, it's you know, part of your own history, but, and you've touched this a little bit already, the 70s is a particularly notable kind of intergenerational moral struggle. Is it different than what we have today? Is it different than what came before? Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is this was not a this is not a family like my family. Uh, I'll just say that um, in that the parents are very liberal, uh, mm -hmm. extremely liberal. Uh, Russ is a civil rights crusader, an anti-war protester, um, and, you know, puts his words where his money is uh, or his lack of money is. Uh, and so, so it, it's almost inevitable that some of those kids are going to end up more conservative, actually, than the parents. Um, and and yet, uh, well, it's an interesting thing. I was actually I did not think much at all while working on Crossroads in terms of a generation. Mm gap, as it were, um, except as it pertained to Russ's no longer being able to relate to the, the young people in his church. Um, that's that's real, although that's a style thing. Um, you know, he's saying, you know, you know what? You didn't invent being right. anti-war. You didn't invent right. social justice. You didn't invent feminism. You, you you know little 16 year olds in 1971 we were doing this stuff in the 50s i want some credit for that you know it's no use why because he's a dork and they all know he's a dork and there's nothing <laughs> to be done about it he wants to lead them in prayer right he keeps using the word christ and jesus not as you know epithets but as you know he's, he wants to talk about jesus it's like oh no no dude uh it's the 70s we don't you know we, we want to talk about uh, you know peace and and love and relationships not about uh, not hear about you know leviticus or whatever <laughs> um but otherwise no i actually um obviously in in uh in the corrections which was my third novel there are these almost 19th century parents um who were 19th century the way my parents were that was that that book actually drew from life in at least with the parents right. um uh and the kids are just it become it's partly a, a it's partly a temporal thing they're much younger they went through the rebellions um the transformation of society but also they've gone to the coast and left the parents in the midwest 
here everyone's in the Midwest and there is, um, you know, there's like there's almost really the most, the only way to offend the parents, if you're the oldest son, Clem, is to say, I want to fight in Vietnam. Yeah. That is like, whoa, that right. is anathema. And um, it's not because he particularly wants to fight, uh, nor can he, because it's, he's missed the boat. He should have done that uh, like 18 months earlier when people were still being shipped there. But nonetheless, um, so yeah. Uh, and in general, I was really trying with this book to see if I could keep turning the pages for 550 pages, just writing about ordinary people, mm -hmm. not bringing in all of the machinery of, oh, it was an interesting time in American culture and, right. you know, name checking all of the cultural icons of the 1970s. It's, um, I really, uh, I was, I really wanted these to be individual people and just for them to seem real to you and for you to care about what, what's going on with them, um, on their own terms, the way you might care about yourself, the way you might take a lively interest in what's going to happen in your own life. That's the, that's what I'm searching for. Yeah. I love that. Obviously I, it's interesting as you were saying, like not wanting to like name check, I feel like in reviews of the book, people were quick to do some of that name checking and some of the cultural icons. It's interesting, you know, in Russ's background and stuff and interesting to think of uh, that not being your interest. I think that seems right to the book to me. The book is not laboring that. It's just sort of like parts of Russ's life. I I think one of the real pleasures of Crossroads and of all of your work for me is the kind of like deep interiority. Like I, uh, one of the, the reasons that I think this book is so moving is I feel like I really know these people by the end of it. And there is so much of their their thinking in the present and their thoughts about the past and they're, they're sort of wrestling inside the, you know, uh, I'm not sure how long at this point the advent part is, but it feels like it's like 400 pages of the book. That's about 400 it's, pages of the yeah, book. And it's, and it's a day, right? So yeah. we're deeply inside these people. And I I think that's a tough balance for like, uh, for young writers, for me to, to yeah, for anyone to get right. I wonder if there's a kind of interiority you avoid because you do give us so much access to their person. Like, I really feel like I know this family and these people and their decisions and how they got to where they got. It was part of why I felt like it was so satisfying at the end to see where they end up. But I wonder um, wh what is the part that you have to leave out to like make space for the reader or to, to make space for another kind of like a subtext inside this sort of like uh, maximalist interiority maybe? That's an interesting question. What has to be left out? Um, I mean, there are, I, I, I have plenty of false starts. I'll get a paragraph or a page or three pages into something and feel like I'm just clearing my throat. Um, and um, I would say that I hate to sound like a broken record, which, by the way, is a phrase that needs to be retired because not too many are, people don't are know what it means. Yeah, <laughs> being LPs anymore, um, although they have made a bit of a comeback. Yeah. Um, uh, the I'm not interested in knowing everything about a character. Um, I'm sure they have lots of interesting thoughts about all sorts of things. Or actually, what I'm really pretty sure of is I'm sure they have lots of uninteresting thoughts. Mm -hmm. They might they might think are interesting, but I don't find them interesting. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it does not put them in relation to a story and to other characters. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and there's a certain so some things that typically will get swept away by the end of the day they might go on the page but they're gone by the end of the day mm -hmm. next morning at the latest <laughs> uh, thing there's a certain kind of self-consciousness and we all know what it's like to be self-conscious and you start be, and and that is so self-referential i mean it's there there's the word self and self-consciousness um it is seldom very interesting it's actually better to do self-consciousness from the outside. It's much more interesting mm -hmm. to watch um, in the third person somebody else 
writhing with self-consciousness, digging themselves in a deeper hole with self-consciousness. Well, then it becomes interesting because you're watching this person, this character do that. But if you're inside that, that sort of ideation is not very interesting. And I would say um, I tend the third rail for me is a kind of shame, mm. shame about myself. Um, I tend to hit it, touch that rail when a character starts to resemble me. Mm -hmm. And I start to think, oh, I'm talking about what it's like to be me. And I don't actually think I'm very interesting. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and, and as I, and it's a weird thing, as I approach writing about myself when I'm knocked out of that deep identification with the made up character. When I start, when it starts becoming me, um, I just feel so ashamed. And then the shame starts to sink into the sentences and it's sort of icky and it's sort of like, whoa, the narrator who seemed like kind of a friendly, minimal presence, but essentially caring about the characters and being nice to them and as nice as you can be to people who are fucking up their lives. Right. Um, suddenly that, that narrator is seeming to kind of be disgusted with the characters and disdainful of the characters. Why? And like when I, and, and for me, that often happens when I, when it starts to, when it's about me, because the only way I seem to be able to write about my own experience of the world is with that kind of disdain and disgust. And that just has to be taken out. Yeah, that sounds exactly right. Actually, as you were saying that, I saw like a passage in the thing I'm writing right now, like in my mind, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get rid of that tomorrow. Like, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, and, um, or or you find yourself making everything very tawdry. I mean, we all do tawdry things. We pick our noses. There's all these things related to the bathroom, all these things related to kind of the, the, the body side of sex that we do, you know, and if you really, again, for some reason, <laughs> when I'm not writing well, I tend to go to those tawdry places. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, well, I don't really want to make the reader feel like taking a bath. <laughs> You'll have noticed in this half hour of conversation how often I'm referring to the reader. Um, and I do want to say that uh, I don't know the reader. I mean, I do hear from readers and I hear from readers that books I'd hoped might move them have moved them or made them laugh. Uh, actually, I'm happiest when they something makes someone laugh. Yeah. But um, uh, but, but I don't want to sound like I'm pandering, like I've done market analysis. Right. That you should be just substituting the word consumer for reader. Yeah. That's not how it feels to me, because when I say the reader, I'm really, I'm imagining somebody who wants what I want as a reader. Mm -hmm. um, I could, and it, it, it's just a shorthand way of talking about how do I deliver the kind of book that I would most want to be reading myself. Yeah. Um, which, and by the way, if you're a young writer, that's a, that's, a, that's not a, it, it sounds pretty obvious, um, but it is by no means uh, the first thing that comes to your head. Right. In fact, I wrote a whole novel, my first novel, before it occurred to me, oh, is this what I want to be reading? Is this what I would want to be reading if I were a reader? Is this a book I would, I mean, and then, and that, and the scales fell from my eyes in one afternoon when I was shouted at by a novelist of some note at the time, uh, who was a friend of my in-laws. And he, and he basically shouted at me and told me, I'm not going to read your book, but I know it, I know it's too long. I know it's, I, and he just like, he, he lists all the things he knows are wrong with it without even looking at it. Um, but you know, he was right. Cause I'd like hung up the phone and I started going through the 1300 page manuscript seeing page after page that were, Oh my God, this is so smart. This has got, that's an incredible sentence. That is so good. Drawing a line through the whole page. Yep. Cause it's like, I wouldn't want to read that. Yeah. I might be impressed that someone wrote it, but I'm not going to want to read that. So, so all of that is contained in that word reader for me. It's, it's, um, it's learning to write the book that you would want to read. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel very similarly, like I maybe like mid 30s, I was like, 
oh, I think my goal is to write books that would have like thrilled my 13 year old self, but would please my adult brain and morality and intellect. And like, if those two things can both be on the page, then I'm thrilled. Um, and some days it's easier than others. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, maybe to go back to Russ, we talked about a little bit of this already about him being a conscientious objector. He was an activist, worked in civil rights. In Chicago, as a pastor, he works with a, a local black church and sort of a Christmas drive. And uh, the uh, Crossroads, the youth group, does relief work on the Navajo Nation uh, here in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, Russ, in his, in his public life, is notably like well-intentioned, I think is, is sort of like uh, the term that feels right to me. Um, he's also a white pastor from the suburbs. Who in a memorable line is like thinking about his own sort of whiteness. And uh, he says he thinks he says a latter day parasite, a fraud it came to him that all white people were frauds, a race of parasitic wrath people and none more so than he. Russ is maybe being a little hard on himself, but he's, he is high. He's yeah, smoked right. yes, he's high, which he's is having a paranoid experience, engaging his worst fears of himself. Yes. Um, but I do think so many students in, in my creative writing classes and, and in uh, lit class in different ways are writing and thinking very sincerely about, about race and gender and sexuality. And they're also thinking ethically about how to write outside their position or outside their privilege or whatever sort of word we use. Um, and obviously as a writer, you have to do that that too. Not all these characters are, are based on, on people that, that uh, yeah, I, I think the autobiographical is not my interest here at all necessarily, but you're writing outside your particular, certainly with like Marion and, and Theo, Crush, Theo Crushaw and Keith the Roach and others. And I guess I just like to hear how you're navigating some of these things in your own work, because it is such a fraught place for young writers, and maybe especially in our current sort of larger sort of cultural environment. Um, how, do, how do you know that you've done this well? How do you find your sort of place to stand inside, you know, yeah, inside that sort of concern? Um, well, I think you need to be careful and I think you need to be kind but you don't want to find yourself in a position where you don't feel allowed to write about anyone except someone exactly like yourself. Um, and, and you, you should always, John Gardner in his book about becoming a novelist, um, said something that stayed with me. And then I was talking about that book with someone in Europe, last week and they said i said there's this one line that really stayed with me which is remember you don't know who's going to pick up what you wrote and read it they might have just lost a parent mm -hmm. they may be struggling with a developmentally disabled child they i mean they're just think be aware when you write of how someone different in a different position than you might read it yeah. um that's a, that can be a recipe for self-consciousness. And of course, the safe thing to do is just not try. Right. But, but it is, um, fiction is supposed to um, be an act of active imagination. And, it, and, it, and it, it is asking someone who reads it to engage in an imaginative act. Imagine what it's like to be someone who's not you. Um, and unless you're writing for your twin brother or something, everyone's going to be not quite like you. So then, yeah, so that's the main thing is to to be to be mindful um, and to be kind. Then there are there are further considerations you, um, and you need to be very careful about appropriating something to yourself that is perhaps not rightfully yours. Um, and I think in general, um, and also you need to be careful not to traffic in stereotypes. Uh, and of course there are harmful stereotypes, the stereotypical lesbian, the stereotypical black person who lives in the inner city, the stereotypical Indian on the reservation, you know, it's like there are all these stereotypes um, and many of them kind of threatening to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to a lot of people. Um, uh, but there are also stereotypes of the wise Indian right. on the reservation. 
Um, and you, you, you know, the, the, so you have to, you actually, the kindest thing you can do is to try to whatever, if you are writing about someone unlike yourself, even a little unlike yourself is to try to make that a realistic depiction of a person because not everybody is all good and not everybody is all bad. So you're really just, that's part of the basic praxis of being a good writer is recognizing the way people really are. Um, which is some good, some bad. Yeah. And I think, and, and yeah, so that's, those are some thoughts that come to mind. Um, if that makes any sense, you can follow up if you'd like. No, that's great. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. I, I did want to ask just because we're in Arizona and we're talking, you know, part of the sure. book does take place in Flagstaff and on the Navajo Nation. And I thought people might just be, this would be the last thing. I'm going to take some student questions. Um, uh, did you were you able to visit the Navajo Nation? Were you able to visit Flagstaff or those places you're familiar with? I was sort of just in some ways curious for your own relationship to the the landscape we have here in Arizona and the people we have here in Arizona um, as it pertains to this particular book. I'm sure people in the audience are familiar with these places as well. Well, I love Arizona and I get <laughs> it. Um, it, I hope it shows. Um, Absolutely. And uh, the particular beauty of northeastern Arizona and northwestern New Mexico southeastern utah um which is navajo country um there is something about that, that elevation um the quality of the light the quality of the air um and the incredible stark beauty just of the land itself um that i find just really moving um yeah i i i don't i don't have navajo friends um uh, I, but I was part of a youth group myself in the seventies, uh, and had many friends who would go and spend better part of their summer, um, up on the Mesa. <clears throat> and, uh, and I subsequently several times gone there myself, um, talked when I was writing nonfiction about that youth experience. Um, mm -hmm. I got in touch, uh, with, uh, a couple who had really been crucial in, um, resisting the reservation system of education, trying to teach actual, uh, teach kids, um, Navajo language and customs yeah. and crafts, uh, and who, and who were part of, uh, part of the, um, revival of culture really, and a revival of a sense of distinct self that was happening in the 60s. I, I knew some of the people involved with that. But no, I didn't. It's that was mostly an act of imagination and some reading. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. It's nice to get to hear about that part of it. I was just up in Flagstaff two weeks ago and was thinking about your book there. Um, if you're game, uh, some, we have some sure. students here. We'd love to ask you some questions. Let's do it. Looking um, forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, first up no is Courtney. You want, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, Courtney, go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Courtney Caputo, and I'm an English major. And for my question, I'd like to focus on the relationship between Clem and Russ. Um, so Clem becomes really resentful of Russ because he sees Russ as weak after you know the humiliating incident. And Clem also spends a significant amount of time reflecting on masculinity, strength, and aggression. So what is the importance of masculinity in Clem's deteriorated view of his father? And how might the humiliating incident scene have played out differently if Clem was a girl or if Becky experienced the incident instead of Clem? That's an amazing question, Courtney. I mean, I was going to express my condolences that you're majoring in English and then you, um, <clears throat> you wrote that question and I have to say, well, you have some aptitude. Maybe it's not such a bad choice. Um, uh, <clears throat> my parents literally forbid, forbade me to be an English major. They said, you can find someone else to pay for college if you want to major in English. Um, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, to your question. Um, It's such a good question. I actually kind of need to think about it. Um, I I will say that Clem's not the only child who is embarrassed by the father. Um, Becky, his sister, also is. 
And Becky, in fact, has this insight. Maybe the reason I hate going to church is that dad is in the pulpit and that if I went to a different church, I might actually like going to church. Um, so I think she's got a little of it too. And he's always trying to, let's take our Sunday night walks and be and work on a relationship. And he's like, she's like, you, you. Um, so it's not just Clem, but he does, he does cast it in those terms of, I need to prove that I'm a man. Um, I was, I think it, I know that everything is changing and our and our and our whole grasp on gender and gender identity uh, is undergoing pretty massive interrogation now, um, a lot of which is really interesting and maybe overdue. Uh, but I do also think that um, that father's model for sons, what it what it means to be a man. Um, that's just, and I think that still goes on, whether you reject the model or whether you accept it, there is some modeling that happens. And, uh, and if you, and if you're a thoughtful person as Clem is not an English major, a science guy, but nonetheless, if you're a thoughtful person, you're, you probably were going to find your way to the words, men, manhood, masculinity in that context, in that very personal relationship between a father and a son. And uh, that, do you wanna follow up a little bit to see if I'm getting anywhere with that? Or if, if that maybe at least, I, I know I didn't hit the bullseye with that, but maybe I at least hit the dartboard with that. I think it's interesting. I would ask, you know, given this idea of the importance of the relationship between a father and a son, how would you extend Clem and Russ's relationship to any relationship between, I guess, a child and a parent, but really a father and a son, what can people learn from their relationship? What would you hope that people are learning from the relationship? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm in the process of creating a large body of work about <laughs> those relationships. So it's, it's, um, uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to answer your question obliquely. And I know we have some other questions, so I don't want to take too long with you, even though I have a feeling we could just talk for an hour and it'd be really cool. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my oblique answer, did I have an oblique? And oh, now it's just flown from my mind. Um, uh, just give me this. Oh, I know what it is. I'm 63. So I was a late kid. Um, by the time I really came to full consciousness, my parents were in their late 50s. Uh, or my, my mother was in her mid 50s, father in his late 50s. I am suddenly now in like real time discovering what it was like to be my father, which is really cool, actually. Um, and and, and I, I also recognize my mannerisms and I recognize the things he, he was, he was he would, the little things he would talk about. Well, suddenly I'm talking about those same little things. Like I might have to loosen my belt after that dinner, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's, uh, so I think inescapably, you and whatever whether and and I think this this goes it's not just about biology I think you spend more time with your parents when you're growing up than you are going to spend with most people ever again in your life they are very important and uh simply but if if only by virtue of all that time spent together um so something is being laid down some body of experience which you may reject you may you may find cool and want to be part of, um, but eventually it's something you become, um, which is, and that would not have occurred to me when I was your age, that I'm going to suddenly recognize what it's like to be my dad, but I'm here to tell you it happens. Anyway, thanks for the terrific question. Um, I don't, yeah. Good Thank luck. you so much. You bet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Courtney. That was great. Um, and John, just to let you know, so so you have a sense of what's coming at you. We have five other students who are going to ask yeah. you. Yeah, and I and I and I don't have a hard out at uh, seven. If you if anyone wants to stick around for these, appreciate that. Thank you so much, yeah. um, Lucas. You're welcome to uh, step up and ask your question. Hello, my name is Lucas. Lucas, hello. 
How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you? Very good. So I know you mentioned intense imagination earlier. However, I was curious to know whether you have a routine when it comes into getting into the mindset of your characters. For example, how do you get into the mindset of women such as Marion and Becky, younger kids and pastors? And would you say that there is a character you relate to the most? In this book or generally? In this book. Not so much. Um, I think the hardest one for me to find a real connection to was Becky. Why? Because she's pretty and popular. She's a senior in high school. And it's great if you are that person, but <laughs> all of us socially less desirable people kind of resent that person. So it, it was it was an uphill struggle. I had to, it was only when she started making mistakes <laughs> that I started liking her. Um, and that actually, I can generalize that. Um, mistakes are really useful to the writer, uh, to the fiction writer. We'd be almost out of business as novelists if human beings didn't make mistakes. And uh, because, because we all make mistakes ourselves, I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's a short route to identification. If you, if you almost you can write a one sentence story um, that begins, he was walking down the street on his way to school. He knew it was a mistake to step into the liquor store, but he did it anyway. Well, hmm, interesting. He's making a mistake. I, I want to read more. Um, but you were asking about how to get into the head of people who are not so much like me. Um, Perry was probably the easiest because he's he's not a writer, but he speaks like a writer and he's got a big vocabulary and his mind is just going like this, which unfortunately mine does too, uh, as you can probably tell. Um, but <clears throat> it helps to think concretely I find it helpful to think concretely about real people. Um, and ideally for me, not someone I know very well, just somebody who I've met and really liked. Um, because so it's, for, for instance, if you're attracted to another person, like even a sort of romantic or physical way, you kind of want to know a lot. You, 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 you suddenly have an interest in understanding what's up with that person, right? Um, you would like to get to know them better. You'd like to know what makes them laugh, know what their opinions are, because then you might adjust your opinions or you might avoid certain time, whatever it is. You, are, you have an interest once you like someone and want to be their friend or maybe even more than friend, um, that can drive the kind of curiosity and questioning, well, what is it really like to be that person that you need as a fiction writer? So um, in the case of, uh, well, in the case of Perry, he's, he's not at all like I was. I didn't do any drugs until I was in college. Uh, and even then, not much, because I would have terrible experiences with them. Um, but there was a kid I knew. In fact, there were a couple of kids I knew, um, druggy, but very, very smart and hilarious uh, when I was in. And I liked them. There was one in particular I really liked. And once I started just picturing his face, um, I just, well, I can do Perry. And I just started writing like, well, what, what would it have been like to be him, to be that kid? And of course, well, he's not because that kid didn't have parents named Russ and Marion and didn't live in New Prospect. But there's just, you know, you're kind of, you're trying to bridge via some wish for connection with another person 
from the blank page to the fully imagined place where you've, you've got the character really going. And, and I do think, um, I think love is actually really important for that. Uh, and also here comes the reader again, as a, as an, as a quantity, I'll mention readers really re recognize intuitively like that when a character, when a novelist or a story writer likes the characters, um, and when you get the sense that the characters are being written about with disdain, mm, it's kind of a turn off, actually, at least for me. How to, does that help? Maybe a little bit, Lucas? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lucas. Uh, <laughs> JP, you are up. Hello, my name is JP. I am also an English major. And I was wondering, I really latched on to that time period of it. I really latched on to the identity as well. And so I have my own stories I hear from my parents about the 70s. They grew up in the 70s. And I was wondering what the significance of that time period being based in the 70s is. And was that something that was directly related to the cultural religious aspect of the characters and even their sexualities and or personal upbringings? Also a good question. Um, part of it was simply convenience. Uh, if I tried to write about the 50s, I would have had to do all this research. Um, and I probably would have gotten stuff wrong. 70s, that's my turf. Like your parents, I grew up in the 70s, so I know it. Um, and what's more, I know churches because I went to a church for 12 years um, and was quite involved with it, actually. Uh, and that's just laziness. <laughs> um less research for me to do but but i was interested um i was interested in returning to religion uh which hasn't gone away even if we don't go to church we have other belief systems that we passionately care about and are absolutely convinced of um but because they're belief systems they're not scientific proofs, you can't actually prove that what you believe a just society looks like is just. It's a lot of people agree with this vision and they passionately believe in it, but it actually, you know, we're all just atoms and evolution has taken this weird course and produced us. Good luck trying to prove any, the foundation of any belief system. So I was kind of interested in going back to a time when it was possible to be liberal, um, even quite radical, but also Christian. Um, and the last time you could do that basically was the 70s because that all withered away um, and religion became much more the province of much more conservative, not to say reactionary people. Um, so that, that, that was a big part of it too. Thank you. Thank you, good luck. Thank you, JP. Uh, Lainey, if you'd like to come on and ask your question. Yes, hi, uh, my name's Lainey and I'm a PhD student studying English education. Great. Um, so my question for you, so the most powerful part of this novel for me was how real and believable Russ's emotions felt, specifically his resentment toward Marion. And the word I want to use is almost palpable. I felt as if it was tangible. Um, and it felt realistic because there were not these cathartic displays of anger, but rather there was tension that was built up across the entire novel. Um, and so what methods do you use to develop such palpable emotional charge within your character's narrations? That's also, these are really good questions. Um, thank you, Lainey. Um, I, I don't actually write ahead anymore. Um, I just start with the first sentence of a book and I keep adding sentences till I get to the last sentence by and large. Um, but I did, while trying to figure out the book, I take a lot of notes, 
um, mostly not very productively, but I do take a lot of notes. And one day, um, this exchange between Russ and Marion spilled out, and it was like three pages, single spaced. And <clears throat> it's basically what the whole first chunk of the book, which is the first two thirds, is building to. It's this kind of terrible scene between Russ and Marion um, in the kitchen when he comes home from his date with the widow. Uh, and she started smoking cigarettes again and has had something to drink and things get a little, a little out of hand and they lacerate each other terribly. Uh, I had that, I had that hundreds of pages before I got there. Um, so maybe that might be one way, uh, you are, you, you are trying to get to the great scene, <laughs> um, and to the to the to the place where that which was buried becomes visible um how do you engineer the tension to begin with uh you know again not to stress my age uh but um you know, I have a lot of friends and including many friends who've been married for decades. Um, and I myself have been in a good relationship for nearly 25 years now. Uh, and, and there, you know, mostly things are good, but there are complaints. <laughs> and so here, here, I think I get to the other key word, which is exaggeration. Um, the, these things that are kind of the minor aches and pains of a long relationship. Um, and occasionally there'll be like a two minute fight or, you know, voices will be briefly raised. Um, but, but, but it's basically fine. You just, you take that personal experience of frustration, um, and Russ's frustration is, well, there's no joy in this for me anymore. Well, come on, you've got four kids, you've been married for 20 plus years. It's, of course there's no joy, <laughs> it's, it's a job. Um, but you basically take, take something you've experienced or you hear friends, and in my case is friends of both sexes, uh, you know, making their little complaints and then just try to imagine a situation in which those tensions are much greater if that makes any sense does that make sense absolutely thank you so much for answering that question thank you good luck with the phd thank you so much thank you laney uh sarah you are up Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm a student majoring in neuroscience. I actually have a two part question for you. So I'm going to start off with the first part of it. What life experience did you draw from that inspired you to write Crossroads? Well, only in a general way, I experienced the 70s uh, when I was a child um, that and, and and so. You know what what winter in the midwest is like um what kids were wearing in a youth group things like that i obviously i didn't have to ask i know um so i i would say yeah. <clears throat> especially at this point in my writing life um with a lot of books behind me and not much left to draw on um i take i take stories from people I care about. Uh, so what really engendered Crossroads was the image of uh, kids rising up and rejecting their teacher. Um, that was a personal experience. Did not happen to me uh, because I am so desperate to please, I would never alienate my students like that. Um, back in the days when I did a little teaching, but I had, a, I had a teacher in college, a German professor, who subsequently became a dear friend. Uh, now he's dead. Um, one reason it's very safe to use a story of his as basis for a novel. But um, I was in the class 
when he came in and taught one session of the class, he was a German teacher and he was not very good with the kids. Frankly, he was much better with seniors. Um, that's when I really got to appreciate him, but he was not a very good second year German teacher. And the kids basically said, well, there's another teacher we like. And if we don't get him, we're all quitting. And there were like 15 students in the class, 14 of them said that they were going to quit. They signed a letter to the dean or whatever. And so we're all going to quit. I thought this was mean. I didn't think he was a very good teacher either, but I thought it was mean. So I didn't sign it. Um, and he was pulled out uh, and replaced by the younger, hipper, cooler guy. Um, and that's where it all came from. Okay, and I also noticed there's like a very heavy emphasis of mental health within Crossroads. So I was wondering, how would you like characterize like kids rising up in relation to the theme of mental health and particularly within like the teenage community? Today, you mean? Yes. <sighs> yeah, that's a... That's a tough question that I'd kind of rather hear your answer to, but um, uh, I think um, yeah, it as you I'm sure know, uh, studying neuroscience, uh, it's a complicated thing. Um, how we define mental illness. Um, uh, often it'll be defined by what will treat it. Um, we have a disease because we have something that will treat the disease. Um, it obviously has a biological basis in many cases, especially the more extreme forms. I mean, there is such a thing as straightforward bipolar one, bipolar two. There is such a thing as schizophrenia. Um, and there is such a thing as major depression, and those have various biological markers. Um, but as anyone can tell you, and, and of course, there's a strong genetic component uh, from some of those illnesses. But as anyone can tell you, uh, you can take you can take the chemistry and you can take the genes and you can vary the environment and you get very, very different outcomes. So when i think today about the conversation among teenagers about mental health um, i see partly a a refreshing acknowledgement of the reality of the pain uh, and distress of mental illness and i also see i see a cultural phenomenon as well and i see a response to the, the situation in the world and um you know, you can become depressed. If you have a tendency to be depressed, you can become even more depressed by the world situation, for example. You can become depressed by climate change. You can be, um, you can be stressed by um, the intense stressor of social media, all of these things um, that can compound what might be situations that would play out differently without those stressors. So it's it's complicated, um, but I think it's good that people are listening to what teenagers are saying. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And our last question for tonight comes from Lily. Hi. Um, oh, sorry, my. Hi. How are you? I am well. Oh, I'm going to have a drink as soon as I've answered your question. So I'm happy to see you, Lily Dean. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for listening to my question. Um, I, I, it's sort of a basic one, but I was wondering, because you craft uh, such vivid and sort of familiar feeling spaces. And from what you've been saying, it sounds like there are scenes you've been to before. Um, and does, I was wondering, does that play a role in how you're able to redraw them or do you draft rooms and environment just from memory or do you visit and research these locations to sort of fit the needs of your story? And then 
I was also wondering if I could ask whether um, the way he, the process of imagining the environment, whether that plays a role in how you sort of move acts forward or uh, draw out your characters. Environment in the broad sense, the, the way sociologists talk about environment or psychologists, or do you mean the specifics of the natural environment? Um, yes. Yeah, so like uh, rooms or like, okay. um, yeah. I, I think um, uh, good. There's there's been a lot of interesting good work done on how the mind works, and I think one of the things the mind does is it it mirrors um, it. So we have <clears throat> to take the example being when you're driving a car. Um, you actually, your body expands as far as your mind is concerned. And suddenly, like you stick out about six feet in front and several feet to either side, you become, and you, and, and, the, and there's just something the mind automatically does. It puts itself in, in a space. Um, and, uh, when I'm writing, I do it unconsciously by and large. Um, but I have like the Hildebrands live in a house. They live in a, what? Terry calls the crappier parsonage. Um, and without really thinking about it, although at a few points I had to think about it because there's comings and goings from the various rooms, but I, I already when I was just first starting to write, I knew that when you walked in the front door, the, the living room was on the right and the dining room was on the left and the kitchen was behind the dining room. And then there were some stairs in the middle that went up to these rooms on the second floor. And then at the far end of the left, to your left, there was stairs to the third floor. I knew all that, um, just like that. And, and, um, and so I was, and probably it was coming from some house that I know it wasn't my house. The dining room was on the, right when you walked in the door when I was a kid. So who knows where it comes from, but um, I, I think, and, and then more broadly, you asked about locations um, like the Navajo Nation, or there's, there's a little bit in Peru at the end. Um, sometimes, yes, I will. Uh, when I was working on the book, um, I was on my way somewhere else, but I stopped and spent a few days. I rented a car and I went to Flagstaff. I wanted to see the Catholic Church there, and I wanted to try to picture in relation to Flagstaff where Marianne's uncle's house was. I had, I mean, I could have done that maybe with Google Street View or something, but I really wanted to, um, I wanted to see it for myself, and it's so much quicker. Like I could just like, in, okay, it's not here. It's not here. It's not here. Um, and also, when you're doing that you're being reminded of the smells and you're and the feel of the air and the look of the landscape. So there is some of that, but most of it is actually from memory. The Peru stuff, I did not go to Peru, obviously, um, to write five pages in Peru. Um, that was based on a trip I'd taken there some years ago. I was very fortunate to take in the, in the high country um, and then just remembered it. Yeah. Did that answer your question more or less? Yes. Um, and, and could I kind of ask a follow up if that's OK? Absolutely. Um, so, drink and wait. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess I was really I was very curious because I've tried to write, you know, short stories on my own and, and the scenes feel so like artificial. And I feel like part of your characters sort of are built into the scenes and the way they sort of reflect onto them. And I was wondering if that happens sort of in the other direction too. Like what do those environments sort of shape the way you draw your characters as you're going, as you're writing, if that makes sense. Definitely. I was, um, I've been rereading a, a Faulkner novel, the Hamlet and, um, it starts with this beautiful paragraph in which he describes Frenchman's Bend, which is where much it is the little hamlet uh, where the much of the novel takes place. And he hasn't gotten, I mean, he mentions people like first there were the Native Americans and then there were 
the French, and then there were the slaveholders and the slaves, and now now the, now there is a population there. But he's also describing kind of like it's river bottom land, and this is this is this is just the shape of the land. Um, this is how it's used, and he's doing that before he even gets to the characters. And and I it, I think given your question, I think that's um, that was how he found his way in. It's like okay, now I know where, now I know what I'm picturing. Well, who's in that picture? I th and I think there's something to your question in that regard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank all six of you for the, um, I knew that the questions would be good. Not that Matt's weren't, Matt's were also excellent, These but I- These were pretty good, John. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll just say a couple of final thank yous, then we'll release John to his drink. Um, and I'm going to release myself to my drink. Uh, thank you to Dean Jeffrey Cohen for his support and to Kyle Jensen, Kristen LaRue, and Bruce Matsunuga for organizing this event. Additional thanks to Peter Jansen and Byron Eschaviria from Macmillan Publishers. We want to thank our incredible ASU writing teachers who work tirelessly to help ASU students imagine a brighter future. I want to thank our students who asked questions tonight. It was so great to hear you hear you speak and engage. And John, thank you so much. Really a pleasure to get to meet you and talk to you in this space. And uh, I can't thank you enough for talking to all of us here at ASU. You had the harder job, and I appreciate your doing it. Thank you all uh, for sticking around. Thanks, John. Have a great night. <laughs>